Welcome everybody to today's sit down. This is about to be my favorite sit down I've ever done. We've done many of them, but I am so excited. I'm, I'm in love with the person that's next to me. He is, he is an author. He is a loving father. He's a thought leader. He is an absolute, absolute advocate for truth and for being challenged and for self-improvement. Peniel, the black pen. My brother, welcome to the show. Bobby, geez, I have to, I have to hold your hand. Thank you so much. Uh, people obviously won't know, I guess, before we got on camera, the conversations we had. I think I'm, I'm buzzing a little bit and I already know that from here, we're gonna build such a strong relationship. I'm blessed to have met you and to have this opportunity to be in your presence. You are, you are everything that a young, proud South African should be. You're opinionated, you're <laughs> not scared, you're driven, you're very intelligent, and uh, man, you're gonna take over the world. And I just wanna be a part of your journey. <laughs> this guy. Know, wanna put my, your name on the back of my shirt and be on the sidelines, <laughs> like go. <"Girl!" laughs> so, you, you know, I'm gonna kick it off with my, my favorite question, yeah. and then we'll take it on from there. But at 17, from my research, you are a straight A student. Yeah. You grew up in Newcastle. Yes. I got my driver's license in Newcastle. Really? In Utrecht, yes. Such so a very, small world. Very close to your. Yeah, things to happen your quick in Utrecht because it's so small. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Um, you, you, you are an absolute fan of rugby. You mm. play very, very well and you're passionate about the game because, like, I'm trying to talk serious things and you're bringing in rugby the whole yeah. time between the serious things. So you love rugby and um, straight edge student, prefect in primary school, prefect in, in head boy in high school. You're just an overachiever. But at 17, I know what was going on in my mind at 17. It was two things. It was money and girls. At 17, <laughs> what is most important to you and what are you thinking about? You obviously went and, and you know, you, you got a phenomenal degree and yeah. worked your tail off. But what's important at 17? Because as a thought leader, you, you are always challenging. You, you, never, you never woke up this way last week. Yeah. You've always been this way. But what are you prioritizing? And what is your sequence of events that's going to happen in your life mm. at 17? That's my question. Thank you so much, Bobby. I, I don't know if I'm going to get a chance, but again, I need to thank you. And I'm probably going to be thanking you throughout the episode. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to mention your staff's name. Of course, absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. First and foremost, Carmen. Absolutely amazing. Thank you so much to her for bringing me here. Um, Vince came up to me as soon as I got out the car. Uh, LZ, who's obviously uh, in charge of production for today. Um, and the story that I've been hearing about your life. Um, like I said, I think I'm buzzing and my heart is probably beating funny now because when you meet a fellow crazy person, <laughs> you're always inspired. <laughs> Thank you. 17, I'm in matric at Newcastle High School in KZN, uh, Guazulu Natal. Um, it was an interesting year for me because uh, I was deputy head prefect in primary. I became uh, one of the head prefects. There were a couple of us in, in high school, so they wouldn't just pick one. Um, it was the first time I actually dealt with authority in a way that was not nice to me. Okay. I was always a, a good student, want to make the teachers happy, make my parents happy, good marks. Great uh, marks. Did, did my most at rugby. I don't know if I was very great, but I was, I was decent. And for the first time I had my choir mistress question my brilliance on stage. We were at Tikis, funny enough. Okay. Uh, performing with the Tix uh, Kamarata. Uh, I, I believe you went to Tikis at some point. So yes. you had a, a, a bursary there for soccer. Um, and she called me to the side because I'd sang a solo and the choir had kind of messed up, at least in my head. I carried on singing. She calls me to the side and she's like, you don't have to always be a star. Sometimes there are people more important than you. And I was, I didn't feel great. Being a prefect, head prefect at primary is very different from high school. Because in high school, a lot of the staff and the headmaster, when they make you a prefect, head prefect, they almost make you like a mini cop. And I've never had that personality. I thought the reason I was given a title was because I get along with the kids and I do well. So the first day, because we used to have a demerit book, 
where when kids do wrong things, you kind of write them up and they get Me detention. And you are no longer friends once you get that book, my friend. I, I lost my book the first day I got it. Okay, And good. you're supposed to get another one. Good I night. never, because I was like, I'm never going to do this. I'm never going to be a police officer. If the boys are smoking in the bathroom, I'm like, please stop because I'm here. Yes. But otherwise, it's your life. There must be order, but I'm not a cop. And some of the people that were in charge of the prefects had issues with that type of mindset. Why do you never bring anyone to the office? I'm like, for what? This translated now when I get to tertiary because there were these people called subwardens in the reses. You know, I feel sorry for subwardens and I apologize for all of them. But a lot of the subwardens I realized at varsity were people that weren't great at school. So they're trying to live their dream and tertiary. Yes. We're like the really cool kids at school. Tertiary is just fun. Yes. You study hard, but you have a good time. You're not there for, but look, we're different. Some of the subordinates are great and, you know, they want a great CV, etc. But I used to get bored. Why are you shouting at me? We're all adults, I believe. Yes. You guys must keep it down. Speak to me like an adult. So I think matric and first year for me were the beginning of my consciousness and realizing I have certain issues with a type of authority that doesn't show mutual respect to people. Um, but I had a good year. Enjoyed my rugby, enjoyed, I was a huge choir boy as well. Um, had a girlfriend, speaking about girls, I had a girlfriend in, in matric. Um, and then yeah, first year was, was, was wild because 17 matric, I turned 18 in March the following year. I was at Rhodes in Grahamstown in the Eastern Cape in Makanda and it was a great challenge for me. It was the first time I was away from home for so long. Is that a boarding school as well? So you no, no, no. This no, was no. university. Okay. Knew, okay. This was university. Uh, mm -hmm. But it challenged me in, in ways I'd, I'd never thought of. I didn't want to become a professional. As no. much as I did while at school, I didn't have this dream of I want to be a chartered accountant and wear a suit. I don't want to do spreadsheets, your favorite thing in the world. <laughs> you know, off, off camera, I said to you, just whatever you do. <laughs> Don't bring up spreadsheets. I get seasick. I need to hold up to stuff when I look at a spreadsheet. Yeah. So I, I didn't want to be a CA. I did art because I did mathematics. I did science. Other kids would take, I think, biology. I took art. And I actually regret dropping music because I did music in grade 8 and grade 9. For the longest time, I felt I was a creative. I liked the creative space. I still draw and paint today. I've made some music, even though people don't really know about it. Um, I wanted to go into the entertainment industry. I wanted to make artworks. But you come from like a single mother household. You get good marks. It's like you have to prioritize what's important. Yes. No one is going to pay for you to study art and music. So I was no. like, cool, I'll study accounting. So I went to go and study accounting. And I thought four years of school, of tertiary, I'm going to do my three years of articles, become a CA, give my mom my title, and then go live my life. The story became very different. But at age 17, that was where my head was at. So very interesting because at 17, you are aware of the sacrifice mom is going through to be able to put you up to have an opportunity that she didn't. Mm. Same as me, mm. to have an opportunity. So, so the way you pay back, you know, that's how we say thank you to mom and make mom proud. And, you know, as a young man, you're processing that as, you know, that's enough. Mom did her job yeah. and she did it very well. Yeah. And that's her proof of, you know, she raised me right. Mm. You, you know, what is validation for that? Sorry, I'm asking about that now, but sure. we're going to that. What is, how do you validate your, your you know, your achievement to that? Is it the same My way? My father. Yes. Uh, I want to start off by saying this. Um, in African customs in South Africa, we had this thing called, well, I'm from the Zulu tribe. It's called Umemulo for girls. It's the coming of age. Mm -hmm. uh, it got translated into a modern 21st. So when you turn 21, your parents would give you a figurative key to the world. You're now an adult, which doesn't really hold value anymore. For a lot of girls, you'd still be a virgin. You can now go get married. For boys, you can now go get a wife. The reality in modern society is matric and a qualification now for most black parents, you are now an adult. My job is done. That's why it's, it's important to re-emphasize that whether it's your mom or your dad, for a lot of us black African kids, getting a qualification, and that's why most black parents will never show up in their child's schooling career 
their tertiary career until they graduate. Because that is the day they are told your job as a parent is done. They show up, they spend money, they travel, they take the pictures and they put them up for the rest of their lives because for them, that's the validation. The fact that you won't have a job, the fact that you owe money, they almost don't care about those things. So I, I needed to emphasize that part. And I think it's something we will need to challenge later. Um, when you think of the Jewish community and bar mitzvah, when you think of other communities where you become a man when you've done something of substance, yes. it can't be enough to have a piece of paper anymore. Yes. In the past, degree meant job for life. Today, it just means you tick the box. My father is what I would today call a wild animal. Uh, he passed away in 2020, uh, Sorry, in February. No, thank you for the condolences, but you must please take them back. He passed away in February, and because he was a wild animal and because he was my version of Satan, I'm convinced that he left us the gift of COVID. My father was like, I'm not just going to leave and you guys have a good time. I'm going to make you suffer for like two years. But it's, it's part of what I've learned to love so much about his existence in my life. My mom, small woman, half Indian Muslim, half black Zulu woman, um, believed in hard work, studying. She was a school teacher her whole life. She pushed that we study. She used to take out loans so that we could have the best of life. Amazing, amazing mother. My father was this wildfire. 17 to 19 children from I don't know how many mothers does not provide for his kids, breeds greyhounds, used to hunt on people's farms, loved guns, he used to transport and supply guns during apartheid, uh, coach soccer boys. So that becomes maybe the link. My father loved soccer. Okay. Uh, he owned three teams and we always used to go and watch the boys play. Um, when his teams would lose, he'd beat them up. He'd beat Physically, them up. He'd beat them up, yeah. Uh, I grew up scared of this man used to beat my mom as well. Scared of this man. On the one part, he was that. Satan, some figure. On the other side, he was extremely charismatic, which is probably how he ended up with a lot of kids. Um, but he forced me from a very young age to navigate life differently. Number one, because I was so scared of my father, I was not scared of any other man. And five years before he passed away, I spent a lot of time with him, trying to understand his mind. Why were you beating my mom and other women? Why were you so obsessed with dogs? Um, why did you not provide for your kids? Why did you love guns? All these, my father's like the opposite of what a good man is, according to society. And I got to understand him and I almost psychologically got to defeat him. And for me, that almost became my rite of passage that now that I've defeated my father, who was the man I feared the most, I now fear no man, including him. So I don't know what validation would have looked like to him. He had an old school mentality of he didn't want me to go to tertiary. He was like, there are three of you, myself, my brother, my sister. You are going to be the first sacrifice. Later on, I learned um, General Jan Smuts was a great leader in South Africa. He wasn't supposed to go to school because the firstborn would go to school the second born would have to stay at home and look after the farm because the family could only afford so many resources. Um, I think his brother, I'm not sure, may have passed on and that's how he ended up going to school. My father had that same mentality of, you're going to be the sacrifice. You're going to after school work and then yourself, your mother, maybe me, will put money together so that your brother can go to tertiary and become the rich person in the family. I only understood this later. It didn't make sense. So I don't know what validation looked like to him. He probably wanted me to work, make money. He always wanted me to buy my paki, which I never did. I refused because he never invested in my education. Um, if he was still alive now, I'd have to think long and hard about it and I'd need my mom's blessing. Should I buy this guy a paki? Not because he deserves it, but because there's something, it almost becomes part of the defeating. I, I, I want to conquer him by giving him this thing and tell him, Look at what I've done for you that you failed to do for me. So I want to process the last three minutes. This validates there's no victim card. Even if you were to check your pockets, there's no victim card. Zero. In your pocket. Zero. So check this out. You want to. You, when it comes to success, there's 
a chip here and a chip here. You want to prove mom right. Mm. And you want to prove dad wrong. Mm. And you've achieved both. I believe so. I have a theory and, okay, two quick things. The first one, the way my father is, is probably why it's been so easy for me to be gravitate to a Joe Rogan, Andrew Tate. Yes. Uh, these toxic yeah. male yeah. figures. Yeah. Maybe not toxic. Well, that's what they're called by society. Yeah, I don't think toxic. I think I think very masculine. Yes. And and unapologetic. This yes. is who I am. Take it or leave it. I transport guns. There's dogs, and this is who I am. Yeah. So I, I don't think it's all good because there's obviously people you, that get hurt. But you don't need to take the bad. You can take the good and do good with the good. Hundred percent. I think the greatest healing my mom got was through me regarding my father. Amazing. Because I spent time with him and I went back to her. I'm like, this crazy man you met, let me explain him to you. Because I'm half him and half you. And the part that is half him, I can explain it to you. When he was hurting you, he didn't know what he was doing. It was insecurities, it was life failure. So you're very right. Learn to... That's why even some of the most evil leaders in history, there is so much good you can take out of it. So much good you can take out of it. So I'm calling it toxic masculinity because in the world we live in today, too much masculinity, bold masculinity is deemed toxic. But I can understand these guys and I feel nothing, uh, nothing negative. The second part you're raising is very important because I've got a theory around parenting and children. I believe that your children must defeat you. And that is how they earn their keep in life. Uh, I almost don't want to leave an inheritance for my kids Whatever I have, you must earn it through labor, through money. You can go and become a doctor or whatever, but come back and buy the family business. Because I know then you're not going to lose it in one generation because you married the wrong person or you went and snort, snorted coke or whatever. So my dad, I had to because I was scared of him. But even with my mom, I've realized I was a child, you were an adult. It is important for me to, at some point to surpass you and become, you become my child. So that when you get old, I can take care of you. But if I fear you till you, <laughs> till you die and those things, it, you never go through the rites of passage. So I want my kids, look, it becomes difficult if your parent is really strong and really smart, it's tough. But if your parent is, let's call it godly, this scary, crazy, influential person if you try by the time they pass you'll be so much beyond ordinary humans that you'll be like it was enough and everyone else becomes i don't know like a child to you so here's why i subscribe to your mentality you know off camera i told you about my dad coming as an immigrant to south africa yeah. with 120 dollars for a stage you know they didn't really have proper paperwork yeah okay so in my mind I said to him, Dad, my best friend, I said, Topi, you did amazing things. Mm. The shit I'm about to do will make your amazing things seem this small. So hold on freaking tightly to your chair. Because as amazing as you are, you know, the way I pay you back is by saying thank you to put me up to the opportunities that you have that yeah. I wouldn't have had in cold Eastern Europe and just whip your ass in every aspect Boom. imaginable. So that's why, and I've said that to him. He says, "You, what? are you drinking again? I said, I'm not <laughs> drinking. He says, what's wrong with you? Just drive. And I tell him this in the car and I'm crying. He says, just drive. I really, I really, really support your mentality. It's, because a, it's a beautiful way to approach life. And if we, so I wanted to close off with the victim mentality. I don't know about defeated per se, but let's, quick history of South Africa. The British came, colonized South Africa. We'd like to say they defeated the natives, the indigenous people, my ancestors. Then the Afrikaners decided to rise up and defeated in inverted commas the British to run with the National Party, our government. And this one is very debatable, but then the ANC defeated the apartheid government. If we want to change this country, if young people claim they want to change this country, they will have to defeat. We call them pensioners today. We've got pensioners in parliament Prove that they are pensioners and old. Go defeat them. Outwork them. Outsmart them. Threaten them. They should be scared of us and not us scared of them. And once we do that, 
you completely remove the victim mentality. And you're like, oh, okay, we see what the ANC is doing. Watch what we're coming with. If you guys think you did well during apartheid, if you guys are still alive, watch what we're going to achieve globally, where the rest of the world starts shaking when they meet South Africans. So how do, obviously through conversations like this, you know, X amount of people watch this, three relight, mm. seven relight. They say, okay, check this out. Does it speak to you? No. 17 relight. And then it grows. But how do we, how do we fast track that mm. mentality? The, the first one is the internet, which we didn't create, but it's been a game changer in allowing us to connect. Uh, number two is there are people in this country who are brilliant at building systems. And it becomes incumbent upon them to do a better job of creating the type of systems. Um, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to speak. There's a mentor. There's someone who's mentoring you now. Yes. I don't know if I'm allowed to mention yeah, on course. camera. 100%. So you've managed to connect with Patrick Pet uh, Pet David. Yeah. Um, I know um, Dan Pena is, a, is another mentor as well. I think Andrew Tate has created a platform. The people that can create systems need to create platforms of high performance and high excellence. Again, and I'm sorry for using rugby as an analogy. If you compare rugby to soccer in this country, from a nine-year-old to an 18-year-old to professional, the systems that exist in rugby in this country are created to find the best talent in the country and bring it through scholarships and bursaries to the same place. Sia Kolisi, the, the, the captain of the Springboks, was found from a township in Zwiti where he would have never had an opportunity, brought to a top rugby school, Grey High, Grey High in Port Elizabeth, Ekabeja, and then moved to arguably the greatest rugby playing province, which is Western province, and then taken up to the Springboks. So we need people to build similar systems to identify talent. Uh, will it be me and you? I'm not sure. Will it be the guys in education. The one thing I know now is it's not going to be our government. It's going to be some of us outside to create these spaces. At some point, I was holding my breath and waiting to see what Gus Becker and the guys at NASPAS were going to do because the global reach they have and their success, I was hoping they will create platforms where the most talented people can just meet. And then after you meet, we leave you because we know what happens when high performance people meet. There's this energy. And it's like, what do you do? How do I connect with you? I've got friends in Dubai. I've got friends in Hong Kong. Please meet them. And magic happens. But we do need the platforms. The internet is allowing people like me and you to meet. Because if we went for the internet, I don't know when you would have heard my voice. 100%. So now it becomes important for people like you and I to shout louder and find other people. But then the systems builders must create platforms for us to connect and work. On that point... On the NASPAS point, is there enough pressure on them to follow through with the conversation that they had? I know there's a lot of turbulence around Rupert and, you know, pe people are saying he's taking his money away. Sure. And you and VT, that, that was one of the best interviews I've ever watched, hand on heart. Jeez, thank you. Really is. I think every South African should, and we're going to put a link at the bottom of this video, thank should so go much. and watch that. that. That's just amazing. It's two, two, two hours odd of just pure, not golden nuggets, just bricks <laughs> going back and forth, back and forth. I was like, ha, ha, catch, catch, pause, right down. And, and how do we create positive pressure mm. to say, okay, you, 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 you've made the statement, mm. follow through with it. Yes, there's hate. Yeah. There, There'll always be hate. Sure. If you don't want to be hated, don't go out to your house. 100%. You, you know, you can start giving iPhones away and one guy will say, ah, I want a green one. I don't sure. want a, a black one. You know, I want a... You're very right. So, so how do we create positive peer pressure mm. to allow them to follow through amongst the hate? Because I think that's where the real value lies is, is, is to connect like-minded people sure. and, and use that as a catalyst, you know, to... Or do we even need them? How can we do it without them? Sure. Um, it's a very difficult question because I actually don't have an answer. I sat with um, a great African mind, a uh, gentleman from Zimbabwe, Joshua Maponga, very passionate, pro-black, pan-African. He's doing work in Zimbabwe now. I think he works with the government there, which gets criticized a lot. He spoke about the mindset of 
the African and how it is currently like uh, an eroded soil. It is like cement, it's hard. And he's doing the type of work to try and soften the mines so that future generations can be able to plant in fertile, rich mines. So when you come up with an idea of, we want to build planes in South Africa, we want to build mega ships. People are not saying things like, are you crazy? Are you mad? You're like, oh, okay, how do we do it? Let's get going. I don't know if part of the work I'm doing is to try and help identify those people and bring them together. Outside of that, I don't know what else is going to happen. I've met some high performance people. If you look at some of the work that Chris Papas under the DA is doing in KZN, uh, the voice that Ntlantlalax is in Soweto. I've spoken about Tutuzane Zuma. It was his birthday on the weekend before we shoot this. And on his birthday, he went to do community work, charity, cleaning up places. Um, I'm trying to find those people. I find someone like Rob Hersoff, third generation money in South Africa. I meet Kulufelo Maponya, second generation money in South Africa. I need to find some of these people because I don't know if this is what Nelson Mandela got right. Bringing certain rich, capable, hungry people to a table and saying, guys, please do something. And if I can get this right, the hope is a Johan Rupert, um, a Dostein, who I think spends a lot of his time in England as well. Some of the billionaires that have left, some of the billionaires that weren't even made billionaires here, Elon Musk, they must get excited about wanting to be here and be involved. Um, Africa is up for grabs, not necessarily for the foreign world, but this is like a virgin continent where we can build like five times better than Dubai and find virgin mines. I mean, again, looking at Kolisi, Lukanyo Am, if they had not been discovered and put on the field, so many people would have been deprived their talents. So how do we go and find and I think I've said this on a, on a platform before, the real commodities and resources on this continent, it's not the gold and the platinum and the lithium, it's actually the people. And if we can find the people and fire them up and get them to see the rest of the world and how it works and give them a platform, if we are serious about finding a cure for cancer, maybe going to Mars, it's actually going to be here. America, luckily, he was spat out by South Africa. They found gold in Elon Musk. Imagine how many Elon Musks are here. White, colored, Indian, black. That are hungry, that are crazy. That are like, I can actually fix the world. You're like, you're crazy. You're like, watch me. And those that do. Oh. You, you, th those actually do. They actually do. So I, I, I don't have an answer to you of how do we accelerate and those things. How do we create the platforms? I, I don't have all the answers. But I do think some of my work is to try and let people know, guys, there's a gentleman called Bobby from Eastern Europe. Crazy little guy. Loved soccer. Claims he's good, but one day we'll challenge him. No problem. Challenge accepted. <laughs> challenge accepted. <laughs> and if we can find each other, because we're almost like a tribe. And it's almost like we've become lost in the world somewhere. Uh, where you're sitting somewhere and you think you're crazy and you're stupid. And when you watch on the internet, you're like... I think that's my brother. I think that's my sister. Yes, they black, they Nigeria, they female, but when they speak, when they work, I need to find that person. And then we build, I've spoken in South Africa about building a parallel government of doers. So if you say minister of small businesses, you're like, this guy's already He's a practitioner. Helping. 100%. Same with that. sports. And I'm speaking about it from a South African perspective, but what happens when we speak about building a parallel United Nations? a parallel world economic forum of guys that are actually, we are transforming these nations, these spaces, and we're not just making noise for the sake of, we can actually show you track record of the work that we're doing. And how do we get those people to come together and almost challenge the guys that are sitting there who are fat, having a good time, have kind of forgotten the agenda. That guys, you guys have kind of lost it and you're, you're working for some of the evil capitalists who almost don't care who gets hurt. We are coming here, maybe we're capitalists, but we're trying to build like a better world. I, 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 love, I love capitalism. I, I, I love it because it's through capitalism that, you, you know, and now I sound like, like, you know, I'm recalling what PBD told me. It's through capitalism that 
I was able to come to South Africa, which yeah. is a, you know, which is a pro-capitalistic country to to a large degree. Sure. To a large degree, obviously you hit certain ceilings where unless you know X Y Z, there's no, you know, yes. and and the internet has actually, you know, lifted those ceilings up. Mm -hmm. it, if I mean me and you are going to create content, you create magical content that gets millions of views. You don't need the approval of yeah. X, Y, Z. You just post it. If the content is good, which it is, it gets views. Sure. It gets traction and, and you grow. But capitalism allows a nobody to actually have impact, yes. to actually make a whole bunch of money and say, okay, this I'm really good at this. I can show this person how to do it. Mm. Okay, he, he's not interested. The, the next person. By the time you show 20 people, one grabs onto it and then you duplicate you duplicate and then you grow a business so being a synergist means attracting like-minded people that are good at different things mm -hmm. and saying guys sit here around this table mm -hmm. how can we solve for x for example we we run a, a cadetship program mm -hmm. for the longest time i've tried to you know bring it up to a standard where, where I would like that to mean something. For now, it means nothing. It means a certificate. It means a lot in our industry because yeah. they know, you know, a Mitma cadet is well trained in X, Y, Z. But how do I, how do I encourage people to come in, mm. teach them something with a proven track record that my, my, my best guy, Eddie Mahane, shout out my brother. He's got his own dealership as we speak now. It's crazy. But he, he lived under a bridge. And now he's got 10 pairs of LV shoes <laughs> and he's got his own dealership. So I've got the track record. Government is not allowing me the opportunity to formally place this as a degree mm. that, that you can be proud of. Yeah. So I stopped trying. I, I, I argue with capitalism uh, ambassadors endorses a lot um, particularly because you're very right almost all of what we call progression today is thanks to capitalism airplanes uh, modern medicine that will save your parents lives um, being able to travel to other countries being able to connect that's thanks to capitalism so i understand why you guys defend it so much the problem i think is a lot of bad people thrive in capitalism. Capitalism almost opens a gateway for the worst type of human to make a lot of money and a, and a huge impact and especially a negative impact. And I think that's normally where the, the, the debate comes in and, for me. And sorry to, to sure. interrupt you. I think that exists in a socialistic... I, I grew up in communism. Sure. I understand it. I grew up in it. I've seen what it does sure. and, and firsthand. For, for example, one family member didn't go to study. He did nothing. Mm. He lives in the same type of an environment as someone that, that's a medical doctor. That's yeah. communism for you. Sure. So eventually, why become a medical doctor? There's no incentive. I, I fully understand. Um, let's just say there are bad people in the world, and that's the issue. Because this answers your question around why governments doesn't want to validate, certify what you're doing. I believe more now in finding solutions outside of government. I think when something has failed, amazingly so, after a certain while, excuses only hold for so long before you start sounding like a victim, constantly complaining, you become addicted to pain. At some point you must be like, I've engaged these people, I've gone to their offices, I've met with some of them. These are not good people, these are not smart people, so we need to find a way around. Um, shout out to Dr. Chris van der Merwe, the founder of Cure, um, and shout out to Yanni Muton and the guys at PSG for believing in the vision. Yeah. Shout out to the guys at Solidarität, Solidarity uh, and Afri Forum to some degree for setting up Soltech. The reality is we're going to have to build whatever you're building outside. Yeah. So maybe my advice to you would be, would be if you can find some of the guys at Cure, they own Stadio as well now. If you can find some of the guys at Soltech, maybe Soltech can help you legitimize what you're doing. Yeah. Um, Try and find solutions outside of government. Because the reality is a certificate is a certificate until it shows real work. So once all the people that hold your certificates are like, I work, I can, can speak produce. about Eddie, I've got a business, I've got... You don't even need 
a government or a regulator. I, Everyone I would be like, I want to go through this thing because I've seen I agree. the results of that. Because, you know, on another platform I heard, why do you go and study? Is it to get the material or to pass? Yeah. You, you know, to actually be able to use the material or just to get the certificate. Yeah. And the, there's a, the difference is, is fast. 100%. We've, we've lost the essence of education. Um, again, I'm going to reference Joshua Mapong. I sat with him and TJ Smoo, a mentor of mine, on a platform called The Hustler's Corner. And he was saying we've lost the essence of education because education was meant to be about going to get the tools for solving problems. Every young child is meant to grow up in a space, travel around the space, speak to elders, and be like, write down a list of all the problems. My father's not around. My mom takes drugs. Um... We've got potholes. We've got a load shedding problem. Uh, our water's dirty. Um, it's unsafe in the streets. These are all the problems. And then you're meant to go to a school institution and say, these are the problems my community and my family has. Please tell me where I can go to go and learn how to solve them and to go and find the people with the resources or the skills to help me. Don't tell me BCom, BA. I'm not interested. I'm telling you, We've got an electricity issue. Oh, you want to study electrical engine? I don't care about all of that. Tell me, come here. These people are going to teach you how to make your own electricity, how to make it cheaper, etc. And then we're going to then show you the people that can fund it, that can come and build it. And then you go back and you solve the problem. Today, education has become, I think the EFF calls it commodified. Education is just like you're going to pay for something just to keep you busy. Schools have become babysitters because parents have to work. They teach you just enough to feel like you know something, but you actually know nothing. Because 12 years of basic, maybe another five, three to five years of tertiary, you cannot plant a fruit or a vegetable. You cannot build a wooden bench. You cannot lay a brick to build a house. You cannot educate your own children. Uh, you cannot make your own clothing. We are, we are schooled but not educated. It's, it's one of the most ironic, craziest paradoxes we have in society today. And if we were to rewire our, our minds, when we go into the schooling environment, knowing we are trying to solve problems, everything we learn and every question we ask is going to speak to that and it's going to be practical. And by the time you go back, I mean, you think of your program. People know exactly what they're coming to learn. It's not... It was nice. They told us, you know, the lighting and it's so great and the five E's and the seven steps too. They were telling us if you take this cup and you put it here and you open it up, you'll have water and then you'll drink and you will not be thirsty anymore. We just give you a certificate. Government doesn't want to validate it. It's almost because you're going against what they're doing because the schooling system and education, rightfully so globally, is a billion if not trillion dollar ignorance business. How can we pacify the masses and miseducate them as far away from reality as possible so that we can control them and dominate them. So you, you dropped a you dropped a truckload of bricks on me <laughs> because I've I've literally I've hit my head against so many walls to to try and validate mm -hmm. something that I've got a track record for that I can prove. Come, come, we've got a training center that seats 64 people. Yeah. Come watch the content. Here's a, here's a platform that we've invested nearly 2 million rand. We've built an online platform that tests you, that micromanages you. How many times have you logged on? What have you failed? What have you passed? Why? It doesn't matter if they validate it. What yeah. matters is the result that student gets after doing the program. That's the only thing that matters. I've got many issues with the EFF. I'm Julius Malima, who flip-flops a lot. I need, to rec I need to commend them on... I don't know officially, but they've got like this little tax uh, system with EFF members of parliament. And I'd like to think some of the people they've deployed elsewhere. They do this because they've realized some of the mistakes of the ANC. The ANC and Lutuli House always don't have money. Weirdly, with one of the richest presidents maybe in the world. Arguably in the world. Arguably, arguably in the world. A beneficiary of the same ANC, Patrice Mutsipe, one of the wealthiest people in the in world. The world. Um, so many tenderpreneurs, so many cadres that have been deployed, they realized you're going to earn a salary. 
thanks to the EFF, we will take a small amount so that we can self-fund. I think maybe the challenge to yourself and maybe to everyone who's going to be watching this who is doing something similar, no matter the scale, um, find a way to almost, I, I know tax is a negative word, find a way to incentivize your graduates, the people you have developed to kind of give back and get them to understand that we're doing this for many reasons. One of them is so that we can help people like you in future so that maybe we can help Eddie again as an example. He's got his own dealership. Eddie, wouldn't you like to get employees that went through the same thing you went through? So you will get the best quality employees. Wouldn't you like, maybe there are criminals in your area. Wouldn't you like to have less criminals? So we will need you to almost pay something back. That's what tax was meant to be for. Yes. And before tax, there was tithing because the churches used to run communities. Yes. It was so that we can help run a functional society. If our tax money is going to government and it's not doing that, I think the challenge for you is how do I make sure that the people that have graduated give back so that we can keep running this thing and they become your ambassadors. You know, I actually studied there. I actually went there. Now everyone wants to come here. We need to take power away. I think I stand to be corrected. The biggest difference between communism and capitalism is the power of the government. Yeah. You want, whether you call it capitalism or communism, to take so much of your power back and give it back to the people so that the most talented of the people get to lead in spaces. We are currently giving too much power to the government and they are proving to us that it's a bad idea. Very. Yeah, very. And I think globally, it's not only South Africa. It's, sure. It's globally. Sure. Look, America, you can, you, can, you can point to so many countries. Your mind is brilliant. I'm, I'm, I'm literally like open mother. I hope my mouth isn't open <laughs> throughout the whole interview. I'm like, how are you thinking this Take it way? easy on the compliments. This is how you get people to buy cars. Clearly. <laughs> no. Just compliments, no. compliments, compliments. No. You're like, oh, no. Bobby, I need to buy a car. <laughs> no, no. You get people to buy cars by, by asking good quality questions. That's brilliant. It takes a village to raise a man. It took a big village to raise you. You've been all over the country. You've been internationally. You've, you've, you've done things. Maybe the two or three people that have most influenced you in the critical thinking that you possess and the ability, because you, you're very interested, you're interesting, you're interested, and you challenge. Mm. Who are the three, two or three people that have influenced? I know dad has a, a, you know, a big part of that. Sure. Who else? Definitely my mom, first and foremost, even though I think maybe we're meant to be speaking outside of family. I watched my mom, you know, I was listening to your story. You're from Struma. Struma, that's right. Hey. Your memory, man. Uh, like, how do we download this man's <laughs> memory? I, re I really, I'm hyper impressed. When I listen to stories like Struma, the fact that you were herding sheep, um, I can always connect some of the dots. And this is why when I look at your family story and what you've achieved, I, I get so inspired because it's almost replaying a movie I've watched before that has done everything for me. My mother, first and foremost... Um, from a little village called Egu Vugeni um, in KZN near Ladysmith. Watching her meet my father, move to a township called Emadadeni with her single mom, teacher salary, moving us into the suburbs after Nelson Mandela and the ANC allowed us to integrate, to moving to a bigger house. Now I've managed to move her to Joburg. Congratulations. Um, thank you. It's, it's important if we can. We, we try if we can. I've moved her to Joburg. She's flown on planes, something she never even dreamed of. You know, her dream was to be on a Greyhound bus, which she did when I graduated. When my brother graduated a couple of years later, I was like, you're going to get on your first flight. So watching that story and seeing it, you know, some people are like, it, it, it does something to you when you see something happening. So you'd be like, no, if this can happen in one lifetime where my mom moves from what we call poverty and fetching water from the river and firewood to what you were saying to your dad, I have no excuse. I don't wake up at four o'clock in the morning. I didn't. And that's one of the issues we have with an entitlement mentality. Um, we are not inspired by if my dad or my mom could achieve what they achieved with where they come from, I have no excuse. And worse, you've actually got that in you. 
yes, it's their life and their story, but there's something in you which has the waking up at four, sitting in a fire, catching buses to get to school. You have to do so. Yeah, you have a responsibility to go as far as you can. I think that's why Elon Musk speaks about Mars. Because he's like, I look at his dad, his mom, his grandparents. His mom speaks a lot about his grandparents who flew, I think, around the world. Yes. He's like, if they could do that, watch this move. I will get to Mars. And then my kids will be like, no, we'll find another galaxy and we'll rebuild the pyramids. You have no excuse. Zero. So my mom very much watching that. My dad had a huge negative impact, which allowed me to be brave and strong. Uh, He was almost like my mini hell, psychologically, not in real life. My father was amazing. And a lot of the guys that he coached, that he went hunting with, love him. I look at my brother now and my brother's charisma, because I'm very serious and boring. My brother's very charismatic. No, you're not. You are (laughs) extremely charismatic, sir. I think we're probably both boring the same. Um, My father loved children. My mother loves children, but my father loved children. My brother and I love our kids. I realized part of what was my issue with my dad, which is a lot of men are not allowed the opportunity to raise their kids for many reasons. One of them being women traditionally are like, kids are ours. That's where my father, without having us, he got to raise his boys, which was the soccer teams. Soccer teams. So he got to be a dad. And that's why the guys loved him. My dad was a huge impact. Um, I won't mention a third person, but I will say this, or maybe I will mention. The two things that have been most influential in my life, and I think I've said this to people that have asked me, movies and music. I think for me, the magic of what I've seen in movies has planted in my mind the impossible. In the real world we live in today, so maybe I'll put music to the side. Movies, because they incorporate music, One of my favorite franchises is the Marvel Cinematic Universe and the Avengers series. Now, it's a movie. Oh, it's fantasy, Captain America, the Hulk. But I'm like, let's look behind the curtain. What Hollywood and the Marvel Cinematic Universe has been able to do, and Stan Lee, you know, one of the founders of, one of the founders of of Marvel Comics, They've managed to attract, this was your question about a platform. Yes. They've managed to attract some of the greatest minds around the planet. Yes. People that are good in cinematography, special effects, actors. If you look at the people that act, some are from Africa. Top tier. Some are from the UK. Some are from Latin America. They've gotten the best people behind the cameras. One of my favorite things when I watch these movies is I sit at the end and I look at the credits. And then you see the people from Canada involved. New Zealand. Hong Kong, and you see all these names, people in Bangladesh, people in Sri Lanka, there were people in Spain. You're like, this is a gathering of some of the most talented human beings, the most creative, the craziest to have ever lived that are coming together and we're getting it in a three hour movie. It's great, it looks great, it makes a billion dollars. Awesome, but I'm like, it's possible. Maybe it's a movie, but these people, I believe, if you were to be like, guys, Take this movie concept and build a city. Build a Black Panther city, Wakanda. Build a whatever. Because you guys have proven it. You've done it for a movie set. Yes. With a budget and it's made a lot of money. I believe you guys can do it in real life. So movies have been incredibly inspiring. In terms of people, I reference Kanye West because of his mind. I reference Elon Musk. He's a bit psycho, but not just his mind, but he creates, he's an engineer. Yeah. And he loves saying that. I'm not a businessman, I'm an engineer, I'm boring, I read textbooks. Um, There was a a man that inspired me for many years and um, his name is Leonardo da Vinci. And I've decided for myself that da Vinci is one of my ancestors and I don't care how, but we have a link somewhere. Of course we do. (laughs) Him, Michelangelo. I don't know if Leonardo da Vinci is a real person. Because I've researched him and we speak about Elon Musk, maybe Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, in Africa, Ali Kotangote, Johan Rupert, obviously with Remgro, uh, the pharaohs that built the pyramids. When you look at Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci and the inventions he came up with and the amount of paintings he made and the sketches he made and the sculptures he made and the, he helped advance medicine because he would take 
stillborn babies and it's just disgusting. It cut them up to study medicines, do the same with animals. I don't know if the architecture, I don't know if a human being can physically do that in one lifetime. So in my head, I'm almost like he inspires me and I think he's the greatest human being to ever live. But I don't know, maybe, maybe Leonardo da Vinci was like an institution. And later on when they told the story, it was like, no, it was founded by this guy, but it was a collaboration of people. Because Elon Musk now is the guy, but Tesla, SpaceX, PayPal, it's people. Yeah, it's people. It's yeah, but then this guy gets the credit. And it makes sense what you're saying. And that's all from one person in one lifetime. Yeah, it's wild. It's the capacity is... Michelangelo Mozart. Mozart, like what it takes to write a symphony at age 12. I was eating sand at age 12. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think I was building sand castles. I, I, I was, was eating, eating sand, sand yeah. but I was building sand castles. <laughs> so it has to be a collaboration. Um, collaboration is one of my favorite words now. Uh, so yes, it takes a village. And I spoke about my mom, my dad. Uh, I spoke about these guys. I spoke about the, the Marvel movies. Collaboration. Me, you coming together. LZ on the back. Carmen, Vince. Uh, Amanda who's here supports all the people that are here the collaboration um, we would not be here if it weren't for the people that invented the video cameras the internet absolutely etc and if we can spark that and make people understand that we can get really far a leader is a reader so I haven't asked you this off camera what are the what are the one or two or three or four books that have impacted you that I'll give you mine as well. That once I read that book, I'm like shit, this information cost me, um, you know, sixty rand on Audible, and I can go and and revisit it anytime I want, yeah. and learn from this person's mistakes for sixty bucks. Like some books have made me fifty thousand rand. Yeah, there's one book that has made me, you know, thirty million rand. One book. It's made me thirty million. Rand. Crazy. And then they're like, what book? Like, <laughs> <laughs> what are some of the books that, that have lit that sp You always had the spark, backtrack, that have put Petra on that spark. To light it up. Light the fuck <laughs> up. What are some of the books that potentially, you know, young people watching are going to be like, okay, I like that. Yeah. I like the, the, the total package. I also want to perhaps... You know, just take a stroll down that road and hopefully that wind that caught you just yeah. catches them and then poof, gone. It, feel, it feels like you, you're cheating and you stole something when you find like a 60 rand book and it blows I, I your agree. mind. You're like, no ways. For 60 bucks? No this ways, is what this you is ridiculous. I'm going to tell you a little story uh, after I've told you the books. Uh, the first book for me, and this is weird uh, because when I say this to people, they don't get it and I, it's fine. Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki is a really great personal finance book, probably the highest selling. It was a great book to help me begin understanding and shifting my mind around money. But what Robert Kiyosaki did to me with that book was beyond money because he actually forced me to challenge. Money's become like one of the most powerful forces on the planet. And if I could change my mind of that, I can change my mind looking at other things. Maybe... Religion is not what I think it is. Maybe politics. Because Kiyosaki goes, if you read his whole range of books, speaks about so many different things. Tax, the history of this, what is happening here. He obviously speaks about parenting. For me, the book was more than just, oh, McDonald's franchise. Oh, McDonald's is about property and not burgers. It was more than that. It was, I had a father who had an outlook on life that looked like this. And I was exposed to a, my friend's father who had a different outlook on life. Yes, it's money, but it's more than that. It's freedom. It's having your child come be involved in your business. You don't even have to have money, but you're a school teacher. Has your child ever visited your school and seen you teach? Like, my mom is actually interesting. You know, it's just a mindset shift. Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and then I read the whole series. Um, the most influential book I've ever read. Yes, I can say this before I tell my story. Um... Before I tell the story, let me speak about the Bible. I am no longer Christian. I was baptized Roman Catholic. 
I went to church. I sang in choirs. And when you sing in choirs, you get to visit so many different churches, which was pretty dope, around the country and even in Europe. Nice. First time I went to Europe was with the choir. With the choir and on a trip. The people that host you are the churches and the people they host you and become your host parents. Beautiful. I'm meant to be like the strongest Christian because of my exposure. But for some reason, I went left. When I was trying to strengthen my Christianity, I went and I read the entire Bible. And after reading the Bible, I decided I'm not going to be Christian anymore because I've got many issues and many more questions with this book. Fast forward, watching at the end of Avengers Infinity War, I'd become so emotionally attached to the characters. Fiction. And I found myself thinking, if I were to consume the Bible like this, because the movies are heavily influenced by the Bible, if I could consume the Bible like this, maybe I wouldn't be as angry, as confused as, as I am. King Solomon becomes a character. Um, Samson becomes a movie character. Uh, Jesus himself becomes like the greatest avenger. And all of a sudden I revisited the Bible and it became, I, I believe it probably still is. The Muslims might argue with the Quran. The Jews might argue with the Torah. But the Bible might be probably the coolest book ever written. The most transformational. So many people have found healing. And now that I look at it with a different eye, it's an exciting book because I could, like, I want to be rich like King Solomon. I had a lot of money and he was wise. I want to be as strong as Samson. So when I'm at the gym, I'm like, I can't be like Samson. I just need to, like, avoid the Delilahs in life, etc. You know, like, the Bible is a very strong book. But the book that has been, the book that broke my mind. No, I'll close off with that. Let me tell the story. Jeez, man. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Like a soapy. I'm like, come on. And, and now we're going into an ad break. <laughs> okay. Please, you have to. But 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 go on with your story. Yanni Muton at the end of, and then they fired me, gives a list of so many books that you should read, which I think are so dope. He references Banker for the Poor by Muhammad Yunus uh, as what inspired Capitec. Uh so I went to go and find that and I read it. It inspired my, I started a little business, it failed later. And many others. Um, Robert Kiyosaki references a couple of books as well. One of them being Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Beautiful I went, book. yeah, I went to two bookshops trying to buy it and they'd run out. I was so annoyed. I went to the library in Newcastle. It was on the list. They went to look for it. They're like, it's not here. This is where you start believing in magic. I searched for this book. My sister at the time was in primary school. She was part of some, I think, drum majorettes, okay. girls uh, marching. They were performing at what is called Farmer's Hall in Newcastle. Uh, they host events, etc. They were having like a bizarre fate. There were stalls. So I'm going to support my little sister. Jeez. I'm, I'm in varsity at the time. Walking around... I get to this store where they're selling old books. I'm not, I don't really care. I'm, there's a book, Think and Grow Rich. It's old. It's brown. It's, I don't think this is the book. I'm, it can't be. Napoleon Hill. Is this really? It's, it's not new. It's old. So it's almost like I stumbled upon and lost treasure, scripture and scrolls. I look at this tiny across. I'm like, how much is this book? So like, ah, no, that one you can have for one rand. That's the 60 Rand story. I'm like, no ways. The, the, the guy in the book that has influenced and shaped my life so much recommended this book. I can't get it for one Rand. I think I ended up giving her like 20 Rand or something because I was like, this feels wrong. She's like, yeah, buy a donkey. It's okay. I'm like, please. I've been looking for this book. I think at the time it might have been 100, 150, 200 Rand. I'm getting it for one Rand. But it's almost the universe saying, we will give you the book however we want you. And I remember sitting and reading it nonstop non-stop. I just wanted to tell that story. Think and beautiful. Grow Rich is, is a beautiful book. People must go read it. I read Animal Farm later. My mom was a school teacher. They had Animal Farm as a set work at school. George Orwell. She used to speak about it all the time. I'd only read it at Varsity and it helped me understand the political landscape in the world. After I read Animal Farm, I was like, I think I want to read more from this guy, George Orwell. And I went and I found a book called 1984. 
1984. So I'm getting goosebumps. Sorry to interrupt you. Please. Literally, two days ago, I'm talking to George Mini, who's the CEO of Autotrader. And, and we're chatting about... We're chatting about training and difficulties that I'm experiencing at the moment. Mm. And he says to me, here's an experiment. Okay, here's a book. You need to go and read this book now. 1984. Two days ago, he told me about the book. The universe is speaking to you through him and through me. Two days ago. I promise you, I, after this interview, I'm going to go pull his WhatsApps. And you'll see he WhatsApp me in 1984. That's crazy. The book you must go read. That book, Beautiful. out of all the books I've mentioned, broke my mind. Now... You have to put this book in context, maybe for people that haven't read it. The Matrix by the Wachowskis used to be the Wachowski brothers, then one became transgender, then the other one became now, then they became the Wachowski sisters, and now they just call the Wachowskis. Uh, so confusing to that, <laughs> man. The Matrix, a movie with, also, I think, produced by the Wachowskis called V for Vendetta, yeah. with Hugo Weaving. You look at a movie with um, Christian Bale, Tay Diggs, called Equilibrium. Um, there's a couple of others. The book has actually been heavily influential in society. 1984 tells a story about a guy living in, I don't know if it was in the Soviet Union, in a communist, your favorite places, a communist space where the government controls everything and there's a big brother watching over you and you can't move. In this book, this guy, the main character, works in this company where they edit history. And when they edit history, they make the current government look good and they make the old governments look bad. And they create these imaginary negative people. So maybe I'll give a South African context. <laughs> oh, apartheid was so bad. And ah, oh, they were so evil. The ANC is amazing. Liberators, you know, they gave us freedom. And so you work in a company where when you... This is actually a bad example. Nelson Mandela, better I'll, example. I'll, I'll Nelson I'll Mandela. It it's a great example. Yeah. No, Nelson Mandela is a better example. There's a new leader. Julius Malema, the president of the country, taking us into communism. Now everyone is living however. You work for a company where every reference of Nelson Mandela, evil, selfish man, uh, left his family behind, decided to go and terrorize and bomb the government of the day. He had a God complex. He did boxing. Obviously he was trying to hit everyone, hurt everyone. They sent him to prison. Somehow he masterminded the government of the day and he convinced them to let him out. And then he brought this ANC government that came and destroyed the country. Load shedding. And, ah, and today our dear leader, Julius Malima, has brought us electricity. And that's the company he works for. And he's like, even when he'd edit this stuff, he'd be like, but I don't remember that. That doesn't sound true. And for me, how it broke my mind is... Every piece of history I read, every story that I hear, and it's worse now because of the internet uh, and all the platforms, you can actually question history. We sit today and we listen to the news and you listen to a president lying and you listen to a pharmaceutical company and doctors and lawyers lying and we know they're lying. And then the newspaper tomorrow publishes Lies. President says, and you're like, no ways. And then you try to fast forward 30 years from now, a child is going to be reading a history book saying, oh, the president was so amazing back then. And they solved you like, that's a lie. And you're like, if this is a lie now, imagine how much of our history has been doctored to serve. There are so many amazing quotes in that book. One of them is, I don't remember it verbatim, but he who controls the present or he who controls the past controls the future. And he who controls the present can control the past. Because you can curate what the past looked like. Oof. One of the conversations we're having now is, but the apartheid government actually built good infrastructure. And the ANC and some of their protectors and defenders hate that. You can't say that. Like, but you guys are destroying things. So someone could come and be like, guys, yes, we're not going to oppress black people and colors and Indians, but... Let's go back and learn from the apartheid government and build ESCOM, SASO, ESCO. All of a sudden, if someone tells a story today, you're like, yeah, but my father says apartheid wasn't that bad. At least everyone had a job. At least there wasn't crime. And you're like, that's wild. It's all based on story. And now fast forward to my favorite YouTube video. 
Yuval Noah Harari, uh, Israeli guy, has written a book called Sapiens and he's got another one as well. He explains why human beings run the world. Yuval explains, or the summary of his talk, his TED talk, is story. Human beings have been able to collaborate and tell stories over time, which allow us to work together and build things. A recipe, uh, a textbook, a blueprint, that is a story someone wrote. And we can take that story and we can apply it today. And you're like, oh, wow, I just baked a cake. Yes. Oh, wow, I've just built an engine. It's wild. Yes. Other animals can't do that. Yes. But the bottom line is story. Some of what we call human innovation today has been the greatest stories ever told. Religion. Yes. The idea that there's a God out there watching you. That there's a heaven after this. Laws. You can't eat a law. You can't eat human rights. But laws allow us to coexist and to behave. I get to a robot and I stop. There's no one there. But I'm like, if I drive past you, I'm breaking the law. Uh, money. He says is probably the best story told today because if you were to go to a monkey, I know you like bananas. If you go to a chimpanzee and you I'm give the him biggest a monkey, hundred <laughs> percent. If you give him a banana and you tell him, look, or if you like, give me your banana, I will give you a piece of paper called ten rand, and then later on you can get the monkey will be like, go jump, or give me all your bananas, and if you pray really hard, one day you will die and you'll go to like a chimpanzee heaven where there'll be lots of bananas. Chimpanzees will rip your face off. Yeah. Um, but these are the stories that allow us to work and transact and travel overseas and be in an airplane, etc. So the person that controls the most power in the world, money, rights, the president, the billionaire, the people that run the ex stock exchanges, it is the person that has mastered story. Mastering story means mastering language, something in your head you haven't seen. Pieces of paper, go get eggs, you go get flour, go get milk. You're visualizing something, you, you haven't seen it. You boil something, you switch on the stove, you put on icing, you're like, I just made something out of nothing because of words. I re this is also the power of education. Yes. That if you can teach a child how to read and then implement, they can create something that didn't exist before. Um, 1984 and George Orwell. Communism, capitalism, the power of someone who is in charge to tell you a story that literally scares you. You can't sleep at night because you visualize a hundred families and children. And if you retrain someone, the child doesn't go to school. Yeah. Someone might commit suicide. It's a fictional story you've created in your head, anxiety. Yeah. But it becomes real. And someone, a psychiatrist, listens to your story. Helps me process. They tell you another story. They tell me another story and they Which recommend a book that tells me another stories. story. Yeah. To alleviate the stress so that you can function. Yeah. Here's the story. Here's the story he tells me. He says, this is a book for you. Incredible EQ. Understands my personality. Understands the fighter. Understands the competitor. You know, understands that I love the guy across the street. You know, we we friends. We can have coffee, but I I, I literally I want to kill him. You man. have to destroy him. I have to. It's like it's that. the only thing that makes sense. So he recommends a book called Barbarians to Bureaucrats. Have you read the book? No. So Barbarians to Bureaucrats says the following: Alexander the Great was one of the greatest warriors. Mm -hmm. Didn't build a country. Didn't build a country. Never created something of substance. He was feared. Yeah. Everybody feared him. They knew, they knew that if Alexander the Great and that army is on its way, it's we game finished. Over. It's game over. He also never, he never slept with the kings in a. He slept with the with the warriors. Mm. He was a warrior, but he never built a country. Okay, so barbarians to bureaucrats takes me to a place where I see myself as a barbarian. Yeah. I want to go and conquer, I want to compete, outwork you. The guy across the street, here's how I beat him. Because everybody says, you know, you, you guys are building, not this dealership, our, our head office is right across the road from a dealership that's been there for 47 years. Second generation, it's powerful. Why would you build across the street from him? Because I want to beat the best. Like, I don't want to beat this guy, I want to beat on. him. So how do I beat him? I go and I say, what time do you come to work? Uncle so-and-so, he says... I come to work at nine. I said, okay, what time do you go home? I go home at four. Like, okay, I'm going to just flip them. No matter how good this guy is, 
He's like 35 years older than me. I've got more time. If I, <laughs> if I come to work at four and I leave at nine, eventually I beat him. Yes. Nine months later, I beat him. So this guy- Is this a real story? 100%. Nine months later, I whack, Jeez. Him, I whack him out of the park, you know, in terms of numbers, because capitalism says, you, you know, you can go and measure now. Yeah. Because it's free. If you if you willing numbers, to numbers are a good storyteller, by the way. If you are willing to outwork this guy, eventually, you know, you beat him in terms of numbers. If yeah. that's a metric you want to use, is his quality of life better at that stage? Hundred percent. Because <laughs> all I'm doing is working. I'm I'm obsessed. I want to kill you every day. Just listening to certain music puts me in a state. <laughs> so I, I want to. F- <laughs> but now here's the other part of the story, and the, the, I love the fact that you say it's all a story. Barbarians to bureaucrats says, you're never going to build a big business because now all of a sudden I'm losing people. They're like, we can't be around you. We can't. You're a wild animal and you're tearing everything. So how does a barbarian become more systematic and start attracting, becoming a synergist and start attracting, you know, people that are able to tolerate a certain level of your personality. You can't show it to them all the time because they also run away. Sure. But help you create structure. Yeah. And that's the book that's made me the most money. Who's the author? I don't know. But anyways, we'll find Barbarians it. Barbarians to, to bureaucrats. bureaucrats. So on every time I go on, you, you, you unf- I'll gift you the book. I'm going to send it to you because every time I go on... Um, Thank you so much. That means you, I need to get you books as well. You, you, we'll exchange. You're very welcome. We'll every, exchange. Every time I go on uh, online and I see the book available, I buy 10 copies. Uh, and then no more for, for, for the longest time. And Patrick, actually, later on when I meet him, I say, this is one of the books that's changed my life. And he recommended it. And he tells me a story that he actually tried to buy the book from the author. And he said, it's not for sale. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's the book that, that literally changed my life. Wild, wild men. I love this. So you, you are a machine. No, <laughs> no. You are a wild man machine. But I think we'll have this conversation uh, another day. Because uh, I, I see myself as a chimpanzee. And a robot, by the way. And at some point, I want to be able to live in both extremes. It's maybe a bit more philosophical conversation yeah. for another day. Yeah. Um, barbarians to, to bureaucrats. bureaucrats yeah. Is yeah. why I said to you off camera, you're meant to be, you're not meant to be rich. I'm not rich. No, no, no. Maybe let me say, you're not meant to make a lot of money. Uh, not because you're a barbarian. There's a way you spoke about scaling your business and your concern for your employees and their dependence. When you have that type of mindset in a ruthlessly capitalistic world, you normally don't get far because you worry. Um, Your type of leadership, I call it parent leadership, which I think the world needs more of. It can't just be that, come work for me. When I don't need you, I chuck you away. Where are you supposed to go? If I'm your parent, I care about your development and your well-being. And I care about the sustainability of whatever it is we're building. I think the best run countries probably have leaders that feel like that. They feel like your parent. And a parent empowers you. They don't keep you stupid until you're 25. And I'm waiting for dad to come feed me. I'm waiting for mom to come iron my clothes. Your parent wants you. And in South Africa, that's what's happening. We're we're actually finding people that are working functional and we're destroying them through retrenchment grants and we're like we're going to turn you back into being a child so you have parent leadership and when you normally have that in capitalism you can't scale because you always see human beings and not tools because your employees are meant to be your hammers and your calculators and your things that (laughs) are disposable no and and when you meet people like that they can scale they can retrench they can cut they can ruthless yeah yeah they're very ruthless yeah the numbers argument is is numbers are probably the greatest story and if you can master words and numbers there's almost nothing you can't achieve in the world um numbers is one of the things i admire the most about jewish business people because they understand that this is a game of numbers and yeah. other people seem to not have that i wanted to speak about touch on the taxi industry elon musk says you work eight hours a day i'm trying to beat you in nine months i must just double it to 16 hours Minimum. I can work twice as fast as you. And if you're ahead of me, I will catch up. Like, it is not rocket science because it's numbers. And yes, I'm trying to make more money. Numbers. 
but I have to put in more time, numbers, mm-hmm. and sell more volume, numbers. Like, that's what we call financial literacy, which Robert Kiyosaki is big on. If you were to teach people numbers, you cannot make a lot of money if you're not respecting time, which is a number. Arrive early, arrive on time. Make sure that you, you spoke earlier about, I don't know if you spoke about it, but if you're selling, make phone calls. On that note, you know, on numbers, yeah. sales is numbers. It's, it's numbers. It's reverse engineering. The, so uh, out of our 47, 48 salespeople, I will mentor six. Mm. Uh, six is the number that, that I like because then kneecap to kneecap, I can process issues with you and five others that, you know, the guys starting off or towards the middle are not ready for. Yeah. And, and this is how I got Eddie and, you know, other gentlemen to, to go past that mental block. Because in the industry, if you're doing eight cars a month, mm. you're, a, you're a rock star. You know, Eddie, <laughs> Eddie had 29 cars a month. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm beating his ass every day. I'm like, you're wasting your time like at 29 cars sure. and it's numbers. So on, on that note, to sell 15 cars a month in our industry, I've created a formula. And the formula is the following, and I'll give it to every <laughs> other dealer that, that's watching this. It's, it's a simple formula. I call it the DMA. Yeah. It's a daily monitoring activity. You have to hand in two applications with documents at FNI, finance and insurance, mm. because over a six month period, our approval ratio is 50%. So if you hand in 10, five will be approved. Mm. Okay, that statistic is, is slowly but surely becoming lower with cost of living sure. and, and interest rates and, the thing. Interest rates and yeah. stuff. But two a day get you to a sorry, get you to 60 sure. per month. 30 get approved and you close 50%, which is 15 cars. Okay. For me, it might be 40 calls. For you, it might be 30 because you're more talented and you, your, your, your control of the English language is, I don't want to get the word wrong, admirable. Is that the right word? Thank you. I admire it. So, Strum, Struma boy doing his best with yeah, the English. I'm trying, man. <laughs> so... So you'll be able to do it in 35 calls. It takes me 60 calls because yeah. I'm an I and I'm an I and, and, uh, uh, and, you know, and I don't have a thick skin. So when someone tells me to F off, they're busy with something, sure. I go depressed and, yeah. and I don't phone anymore. So it's numbers. So you want to make X amount of money is 15. You want to make this money? Yes. Here's what you need to do. 40 calls. So two put apps, in two applications. With docs. To try and get a 50% approval rate. To, to close, close 15. 15. To close 15. So you want to make X? Yes, I want to make X. This is your formula. I give it to you. Here's your formula. Now when you start failing, you know, we have a different type because a different Bobby shows up to that conversation. <laughs> Say, buddy, me and you had a conversation. You want to make X because you want to do this for your mom and this for your child. Yeah. I'm calling your BS out because the door's freaking closed. Sure. You're not making the calls. I can see because I track it. You're not making the calls. You want to lose weight and you're not even, you're not even taking a walk. I love numbers. I don't like you're spreadsheets. Not making a pu- you're not doing push-ups. You're not cutting down on your sugar. It tells a story. Numbers tell a numbers. story. Numbers. Yeah. If we can master numbers. Oh, boy. Taxi industry barbarians to bureaucrats. Let me start with the taxi industry. The reason the taxi industry, if it remains the way it is in South Africa, is going to get steamrolled. Is because the barbarians are not making an effort to become bureaucrats. They barbarians now to, to become systematic. Don't ever become a bureaucrat. That's the other thing that the, the book teaches you because it's two extremes. Sure. Where you want to be as a barbarian is center right towards a barbarian, but center towards a barbarian towards a barbarian, because if you too much of a bureaucrat, yeah. you're gonna allow way too many things to to go on without actually actioning sure. and, and fixing. Over, so, over analysis and yes. being too risk averse. But I, but I agree. How can, how can one company, mm. TC, control such a big market? It's because there's way, way too many barbarians yes. that haven't figured out how do we systemize our business. Yeah. And they've controlled it for years. 
They've lost, they're losing control now, but they still got a grip. On yeah. But I would love to hear your opinion on the tax. No, industry. no, no, no. You, you're very right. And you, you've said everything. Transaction Capital, SA Taxi, they came in with the, you know, we Systems. can see Bobby's a wild man, but he gets things going. We'll give you a template. That's normally how franchises come about. Yes. We see you work hard, you and your wife, or let's plug you into a system so that you don't have to stress about the accounting and the marketing and the... We'll handle that. We'll make we'll the money. We'll handle all of that we'll so make you can be money. a wild person. you good with the customers. You laugh. You come up with crazy specials. Do your thing. Be a barbarian, whatever that looks like. I was saying this to someone recently. You cannot build a first world economy without slave labor. Uh, a first world economy can be a country. It can be a city, can be a neighborhood, it can be your family, whatever first world economy is, but it needs slave labor, whether it is in-house or external. So Stellenbosch becomes rich because it's selling to the rest of South Africa, wherever they, however they are exploited. China enslaved its own people, as an example, and then they need the rest of the world to buy from them. Um, city like Johannesburg, Becomes rich because there are mines everywhere else, Bumalanga, Northwest. There are farms somewhere where people work to, to the bone. I'm saying this because you require, speak about Alexander the Great, Genghis Khan. I was thinking of even Sheikh Guevara because he never became a statesman. He was on the streets yeah. killing people and, yeah. you know, until barbarian. he was killed. Barbarian. Um, you need a barbarian at the foundation. Uh, absolutely. To build a foundation and mix the cement like... One of the other problems we've got in the world is we're sending a lot of kids to become bureaucrats. Oh, we've got all these accountants and all these lawyers, and but you've got no barbarians. Where we're supposed to be the leaders, and I guess this is where the book comes in for you, is you yeah. must try and merge these two. Because when the barbarians are becoming problematic, you can strangle them and be like, shut up, calm down. Because I speak their language. Because you speak their language. When the bureaucrats come in with your favorite, the spreadsheets, you're like, oh, okay, let's read them. How long is this meeting? Do I need to look? Can you not explain it to me? But there's a, there's a nice balance. I think that's what we're lacking in this country as well. Can I give you my, my honest opinion? I'd love to get feedback from you because I, I put that book in any situation. Yeah. And at the moment, with the ANC, mm. you've got the barbarians that, that fought for change. Yeah. We absolutely have to end this. It's unjust. It's unfair. Sure. We have to end it. And we're willing Wh to do whatever it takes. Bom whatever. Okay. Boom. The barbarians come into power. Mm. And that's where I believe the few years that were crucial of attracting systematic people mm. around them because... You know, on, on your talk, that's why I loved your talk with VT. When you are designing a process and designing a system, you have an ego view of what it should be. Mm. So you can design a good system because there's never a perfect system. But you need managers to manage the system. Yes. And it's normally not the barbarian. Like, if I had to manage the buyers every day, we've got 21 national buyers, they all resign. <laughs> they all resign I manage a guy that can understand me sure. and he manages them sure. that's why we've built a successful buying team yeah. and a successful sales team the yeah. moment I get too close to sales they all leave sure. and it's happened like a couple of months ago you're a terrorist that's why 100% yeah. but with the ANC I believe you know, and I, I believe it's not too late for good leadership to have self-awareness and say we we got us here. We were the barbarians that, mm. that created the change which was so necessary. Mm. Now we need systematic people instead of becoming a bureaucratic you know, government yeah. where we just, we just bring friends and, and homies and people yes. that will dance to our tune and not have an opposing opinion. Sure. Because the barbarian and the systematic person don't agree 90% of the sure. time. But there's a middle 10% which is good for everyone. Um, in rugby, we've got a term called the butcher and the artist. Yo, that's why I didn't play rugby. I was here, my friend. I was here. The rugby thing. No. No. Just here. I was, I was just here. No, I was here. I was just here. No, the butcher and the... And the artist. Oof. So a good coach, a good coach when they recruit, 
players in their team will get a butcher and an artist. Um, same thing happens in football, by the way. Normally, the butcher will be the defenders. The guys who Mark make fish. sure they Mark chop fish. down anything that comes through. So you need guys that are in the engine room, the barbarians. The, he's not here for the honeys. The honeys are not, they don't know. That big, ugly guy who's <laughs> bum, bumping into everyone. And then there's the artist. The guy who paints the beautiful pics. The one who actually brings the honeys. Yes. The one who, when he catches the ball and the way he runs and the way he scores, it goes like, oh my, when this guy catches the... You need that. You need, again, barbarians to bureaucrats. And my brother and I are big fans of psychology. He's a psychology major, but we watch a lot of content. Carl Jung, uh, I think Emmanuel Kant, some of these philosophers. Um, this is not just a... These are barbarians, these are bureaucrats. This is meant to be a, a personal thing. You have a dark side and a light side and how do you balance them? And some of the weakest leaders don't have one of the sides and that's why they easily get removed. Because you need to, at all times, uh, uh, Jordan Peterson speaks about every man or the, the best men are dangerous men. Yes. You need to be a wild animal. And again, this is why I learned to appreciate my father later. And I realized with my mom, at least, and other people, I'm like, you guys didn't realize what animal you're dealing with. And if I was, if I'd arrived earlier, I would have explained, oh, rub his tummy, feed him a biscuit. He'll do anything you want. You know, old school, traditional men, just, he can't come home and you're like, what's for supper? Yeah, Vietnam, you must go. He's going to get cranky and you're like, oh, my husband is so angry. Of course, you didn't rub his tummy. You're like, oh, oh big muscles. Please come help me move the bed. He's going to lift it with one hand. Yeah. I'm appreciating. That's how you get this wild animal to behave. But anyways, for the individual, be a wild animal, but know how to contain it. You cannot be wild at home. When you're a dog, you play with the kids. Pit bulls, which are a very sensitive topic in South Africa. You play with the kids. You, you laugh. They sometimes kick you. Ah, you run away. They feed you, you eat. When a stranger comes into the gate, I thought you want to speak about Barbarians at the Gate because that's a very popular book. Yeah. When a stranger comes into the gate, when a stranger plays funny with the kid that you always, you tear it apart. Yeah. And right after that, when your owner comes in, ah, oh, you become a little darling. And some of us have lost that. And especially I think for men, They've become so desperate and so broken that they take out their wild animalness on the wrong people. Yes. On your sales team, on your buyers. When those are not the people, it's the guy across the road. I, I, I think that leadership, that, that, that leadership animosity is so necessary. I've got to, unfortunately, we had to demote a sales manager mm. because the, the light side is so light mm that people actually take advantage sure. of it because there's no dark side. Yeah. For me, the best, the best branch manager, I've worked with a lot of incredible branch managers, mm. but the best ones, the three or four that I can count on my hand, have got this dark, dark side that people will follow them. You know, I've got a few now that if something went wrong and they had to leave, I'm losing 60% of myself. Jeez. But those are the guys that I'm most attracted to because the dark side, when it's necessary, it's there. And that's leadership. And everyone sits up. Everyone sits. They're not going to burn the house down the whole no. time, but they can. You that know, that they, I think for me, specifically when we think of the future of, or the present and future of masculinity, because women today miss that. They miss having men around and feeling safe. Yes. They miss knowing that this thing is broken. Call a man, he'll fix it. Yes. We need to be working towards that. And the education we have, arguably elitist academic, we don't have enough guys working with their hands and getting their hands dirty because it, it does something to you. Some of the greatest CEOs, other execs, men I've met, even if they work for a nice company in boardrooms, they lift the weights, they chop the wood, they go camping because they need to feed the beast. Yes, feed the beast. You need to feed the beast because the beast is what gives you the edge. And sometimes you don't have to do anything. You walk into a space 
and the women get a bit softer and the guys sit up a little bit. You haven't said anything, but the guys are like, I can feel that energy. You can feel the energy. I can feel. So, so I've got a, I, I like telling stories through life experiences. The biggest jump that I've seen from an individual starting off as a cadet to becoming a branch manager, the fastest that I've ever achieved that with someone was a conversation I had with someone. So he's a young guy, 23, 24 years old, just married. And he's a cadet. So he's, he's not earning a big salary. He's earning eight, eight and a half thousand rand. Yeah. Okay. Wife's a qualified attorney. Okay. Very pretty girl. He's a good looking guy. He's a rugby guy. Hey. So the rugby I, guys are very good looking. Yeah, yeah. The soccer guys are... Uh... <laughs> we rock. <okay. laughs> so I say to him, that's your wife. Congratulations. He said, you're a great salesman. You, you, you're all right, but you're not freaking oil painting. <laughs> you know, congratulations. You're a good salesperson. So he says, no, thank you. She, you know, she's very successful. I tell him this. Maybe you decide. We don't put this on the interview and we remove it. But it's okay. I'll tell you what I told him. <laughs> said, you see that girl there? Yes. That girl needs you to be successful. That girl is not with you in three years from now unless you're successful. Yeah. Unless you're a man. Unless you're a provider. Okay, so check this out. Who does she work with? Now, big law firm he tells me. Yeah. Who's at the law firm? Other lawyers. Her age? Polished? Like Steve Harvey. You know, that, that level of, of suave. You know, mm. that's the people she interacts with. Unless you grind and be a man and be a provider and overtake her income, you know, the chances of you and her making it long term, you know, is, is diminished. You're a dangerous guy, you. So he says to me. You're actually horrible at what, motivation. Why, why are you telling me this? I said, because I can see you love this girl. And to, she's pretty and she's successful, boy. Today. You've got a commodity here. Today. I'm actually not even joking. Today. So about... Two hours before me and you met, I was in HR's office promoting him to branch manager of Mitmac 2. He became a branch manager today. He earns way more than she does <laughs> and her <laughs> colleagues do. But today, and it, in a very short period of time, a couple of months, less than a year, because that masculinity mm. of me and him having a conversation when nobody's listening yeah. and me talking to him that way made him so uncomfortable. He decided to fucking, you know, reach down his pants, <laughs> find his balls and, and, you know, do something about it. So I, I, I'm very attracted to, to that mindset. Very, very, very. Hey, my father, in his infinite wisdom, um, my father once said to my brother and I, if you ever want to succeed in life, date a pretty girl. And he's like, when you have a pretty girl, Knowing that other guys want her, competition. you're going to step up. Competition. When she comes to your place, you're going to clean that day. You wanna, at the time, I was like, oh, this guy's smoking pips. I want to go with a nice personality and we get along and we laugh. Uh, it's horrible advice. Don't ever advise guys. Guys are going to get depressed. It's, it's, it's very good advice because the beautiful young lady off camera is way too pretty for you. So this you guy. need to step up constantly. So big up to dad's we advice. Can, we can shut down this interview. <laughs> <laughs> the most amount of golden bricks ever thrown in our studio. Okay. I want to ask you this. If you're speaking to the masses of South Africa, masses, youth, the future, ages between 12 and 19, what are two or three things that you want to come across clearly that you think will make a difference and will change the perspective and get rid of this victim mentality that nobody's coming to. What are the two or three, three things that you would like the youth to consume, digest and apply? Twelve, 12 to 19, 20, 21 year old. Because that's when, I think that's when the trees Sure, beginning to you know you can bend the tree there, mm, but it's it's gonna start strengthening and yes at that point. But there's still time there, I think. We have made um, 
honesty unfashionable and we've almost criminalized the truth and that's why when someone tells the truth it's so uncomfortable and so foreign especially when they put it like in a tough like in three years time you will have lost this girl what um some of the best advice that i think i got or some of the people that gave me the best advice i guess on the internet gary v gary vaynerchuk is a media guy in america our book of the month is is from gary v really company yeah, that's yeah. really dope yeah yeah gary is like he's an immigrant yeah yeah he Russia, speaks about yeah, immigrants yeah, belarus i love gary v uh, i'm a huge fan so i've got my own belief system called penalism yes. and one of the principles is having a foreigner mindset yes because there's something unique about being a foreigner and you don't have to be in another country you can be from cape town moving to choburg agree you're fresh you're on your toes everything looks like an opportunity um with the immigrant mindset he was like or oh, one of his things is everything is my fault everything I is my have, fault i must have said Everything is my fault in the last month a couple of thousand times. Because it's probably true. Everything is probably your it's fault. It's not probably true. It is true. Company does well, my fault. You. Company does poorly. It's you. There's something you're doing wrong. Everything is my fault. I'm poor. I'm living in a shack. I'm uneducated. The ANC government is breaking the country down. It's my fault. It's my fault and I need to fix it. You can fix it for yourself. You can fix it for the country maybe. They might be lucky. You know, you look at even the Nelson Mandela story. Nelson Mandela saw injustice for him and for his loved ones. And he was like, I need to fix this. And on his way to fix it, he realized, geez, everyone's got the same problem. Yeah. We want a fair shot. I'm yeah. willing to work hard, I'm willing to roll up my sleeves. Yeah. I want yeah. a fair shot. So, we all want a fair shot and people are saying, I'm brave. I'll lead them. It's fine. Everything is your fault and I've said to people before the first step towards true wealth. So true wealth is not just money. It's good health, it's good spiritual grounding, um a great lifestyle, having good people around you. The first step towards true wealth is self-awareness. You have to know yourself and you need to be brutally honest. Maybe you can lie to the world. Oh, I'm, you know I'm doing really well. Be honest. I'm a cadet. I'm not doing too great. But a really hot chick who's in a space where other guys will destroy me. How do I get somewhere? And obviously part of it is making money. Part of it is if I'm not in good shape, let me go to the gym. Part of it is I'm from Bulgaria, my English is kind of not really great. Let me fix my English because I think this girl likes English or Afrikaans or whatever language. So let me master the gap. Like be aware of who you are, your shortcomings, what you're great at. Gary also speaks about zero in on what you're brilliant at and where possible. He says outsource all the stuff you're shit at, but you can always develop, but outsource as much of the spreadsheet stuff as possible and focus on this is if people are going to pay me a million bucks to shop, it's going to be for this. Yes. Cuz I have met 10,000 people and they don't have this. I have this. And apparently it's unique. Cuz if you're going to try and compete with guys on the rugby field, like now nah, I'm I'm here. with the soccer guys and yes. I'm unique and I stand out and and so be self aware and figure out your strengths and and weaknesses. Ah look I'm going to give all the advice from Gary today. Um a lot of people are looking for instant gratification now. There's delayed gratification. Building a house we want to put it up in one day but the foundation takes a while to set and if you want a decent house you need a strong foundation. There are people now that speak about smart work. I want to work smart. Uh do online, let me trade forex, let me no I'm going to make a quick 50,000 if you There is smart work, but on a long enough timeline, smart work will never ever ever beat hard work. So you need to fall in love, fall in love with the hard work, the process. Now if you can fall If you can become obsessed with the hard work and smart work, it's game over. People literally look at you like you're a myth and they're like this guy probably stole money, probably sells yes. drugs, he's probably fronting for someone yes. and it's like sure because how I live is is unbelievable. 4 in the morning till 9 at night. It sounds scary. 
Pakistani uh, puzzle shop owners, and maybe this is a message for the black masses because they've lost this puzzle shop industry. Almost every black person I've met who lives in a township and maybe has owned this puzzle shop can explain why Pakistanis, Somalians, Ethiopians dominate. So they already know the answer to the test. They already know, but they are not willing to do what is necessary. Yeah, but these guys open at six in the morning. Yeah, but these guys sleep in the shop. Yeah, but these guys come together and they buy in bulk. Yeah, but these guys don't take days off. I'm like, oh, you already know. Then get to it. And if you're not willing to, you'll always be steamrolled by the people that are willing to go animal, go crazy, go immigrant, and, and outwork you. And if you end up, <laughs> if you end up picking up a habit of working like that, Unfortunately, one of the drawbacks, the guy who can afford the beach house never gets to enjoy it because he's fallen in love with the process. He's going to go and buy beach houses, but if you put him there, he's going to have withdrawal symptoms and like, I want to get back to work. Yeah. That's what it is. And the last piece is um, you need to fall in love with the running, I think, and not the destination. The running. Because yeah. you will hit those milestones just as a byproduct. When you fall in love with the 40 calls, I can do 50 calls a day. I can do 60. If I come in earlier, if I follow up on this, by the time you're booking the sales and the whatever, and someone's like, oh, you've just gotten a bonus. Like, oh, thanks. But you guys are actually wasting my time. I don't know why we're having this congratulatory. I don't need you. I'm, I've actually got three calls to make now. Because I'm in love with this. In love with the process. So, in love with the process. So what Patrick taught me that I was able to teach to Eddie was, so he believes in four things. First one is outwork. So outwork means, you know, in, in mine and Eddie's relationship. So that average guy there across the street mm -hmm. that can't hear me and you speak, that guy's average. He makes 40 calls a day. Sure. You're going to make, you're going to make 200 calls. 200 calls at three minutes, there's not enough time. I'll teach you how. Sure. So outwork for a long time. Correct? That's something you can control. 100%. You can control it. Yeah. You can't control interest rates, but sure. I can control how many people are phone today. Yeah. You know, 200 calls a day in 10 days, you've called 2,000 customers. He's maybe called 200 customers because he, he has to do 40, but he does 12 and then he has lunch. Okay. So outwork, out improve. He has to do one book a month. You, my man, are doing one book a week mm. because you run in the morning. So you're going to take the hour in the morning and you're not going to listen to Snoop and Dre. Mm. You're going to listen to the boys. You're going to listen to a book. Yeah. So out work, out improve, mm. then out strategize. Okay. So the moment that you hit 15, three months in a row, our relationship's not working anymore. Something needs to change, which in that case was his own FNI, finance and insurance manager, that only works for him. Mm. Then he had a PA and a driver. Okay, out strategize. Because now we, where can we buy time? Mm. You're wasting time taking costs to sure. with you. You need a driver. And then outlast. The last one is outlast. Because a lot of people work their butts off for three days. Yeah. And then they're off sick. <laughs> you understand? Outlast means, so me and him went full tilt for two years. And, you know, he made a big number. He made a couple of million rand, um, you, you know, that saved. After expenses, that saved. Bang that money. And he's able to open his dealership. But a lot, a lot of people say, you know, they're willing to work hard. Mm. But very few actually, 100 actually do. Very Jeez, few Bobby, actually thank you. do. So I think on that note, I'm going to declare this as my favorite sit-down. Nah, this really guy. Is, I promise you it is. Because... You, you know, I, I'm not afraid going political with you. I'm not afraid going psychology. I'm not afraid going money. I'm not afraid going in any direction. And you stand your ground whether you agree with me or not. And then I gave you my opinion. Whether you take it or not, it's cool. It's my opinion. And that's why I love doing this, you know, as a side hustle. It generates no money. <laughs> no money. But it gives me such pleasure. And hopefully, you know, it adds value to people's lives. I really appreciate you. This has Bobby, been the I'm, time I'm, of my life. I'm so inspired by your story. Um, 
when you find your tribe, man, it, it doesn't take much to actually click. Don't have to like take six months. Oh, yeah, I didn't really like this guy when I met him. Um, when you find your tribe, man, you click. And from when, literally, when we got out the car, I could feel the energy. Then I looked around. Okay, when I was driving here, I saw the billboards. I'm like, these guys own town or something. Mitt McDowell. So I had the mayor here. So the mayor, the mayor comes here. Sorry, off, sure, off sure. topic. He comes here, sits down. He's there's four, five bodyguards with guns. I'm very nervous. I'm like, geez, bro. <laughs> So he says, no, we came into, into uh, Mitmak town. I said, I said, yeah, you're the mayor outside these walls. Yeah, you listen I'm to me. I'm the boss. Then the guys are all nervous. So he said, relax. <laughs> 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 that was a fun conversation. I'm, I'm, I'm so inspired, not just by meeting you and your team and hearing your story, by, but also by the relationships we're still going to pull together, um, the work we're still going to do, the cars we're still going to sell, uh, a car you probably want to convince me to buy as well but I'm inspired thank you so much for creating this platform for inviting me it really means a lot to me and again I have to thank Carmen uh, I think you've unfortunately spoiled and broken the poor lady because now she's got that fire no she's she always was... at it she's been with me for how long 10 years yeah no, that's definitely. beautiful Ten years, again, yeah. that's parent leadership because yeah, a parent just, doesn't let go of their kids. No, their kids outgrow them at some point, but it's like this is your home. Yeah, no, definitely. No, no, she's 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 one of us. Definitely. Boris the Blade <laughs> is your official name. I'm letting people know. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate you. Boris, I've had thank tons you so of much. fun. Bobby, I appreciate you. Thank you so much.